when we talk about biodiversity loss, I'm slightly troubled by the word loss because we haven't lost these species. We haven't inadvertently left them behind the shed. We've destroyed them or we've destroyed their habitats. So it's not a six mass extinction event that we're precipitating. It's a mass extermination event. Tell us a little bit about uh, your new series. It's a biography of our planet. Um, it's not chronological, so we don't start with the formation of, of the planet, uh, but we cherry pick the most important parts of its biography, if you like. So it would be its first step, its first word, its first kiss, its first <laughs> marriage, first yeah. divorce, second marriage, whatever it happens to be. So we choose those points. And we've been very much driven by some of the more exciting new science as well. So that's you know, facilitated our, our choices when it comes to what we've in, included. You're obviously best known as a naturalist. Um, so why were you drawn to working on a project about you know, the history of our natural world? The best bit of my job, people always imagine, is like meeting animals firsthand, getting up close to things, visiting habitats where they exist, so on and so forth. Um, it's great, uh, but it's not the best. The best bit is that my life has been a lifelong learning experience. I go out every day and sometimes face to face I meet scientists and they tell me things that they're passionate about, they, they're researching, they tell me their ideas and, and it's an infectious environment and I find that really, really stimulating. So here's a program which is like almost sort of 50% Chris, the life bit of it, the planetary processes. I mean, I did my GCSE in geology way back in the 1970s, and I read your magazine and I read all of those sorts of things, but I hadn't integrated the two together. I'm far more interested in the bigger picture complexity. I like the detail, of course, but I like knowing how things work, not just as, say, a single organism, but as an ecosystem or in, in the case of our series here, that the, the planetary ecosystem. And I was very surprised how much interplay, significant interplay, there'd been between planetary forces, essentially abiotic physical forces, and life throughout its history, and how life had also influenced those forces. And there's been this constant sort of juxtaposition roller coaster um, since life first appeared on our planet, a very long time ago, as, as we know. The other thing is that there's a lots of, you know, exciting new science basically, things which will prick up the ears of our viewers and they'll be very much surprised by. So you mentioned that it is full of, of this relatively new science and the, the areas where things are maybe a little more murky and we don't quite know what, what has happened. Um, why did you think it was important to in include that sort of development? Well murky science is, is always tricky but it's nevertheless interesting. Mm. There's a foundation of truth in there somewhere. Someone's got some data, they've seen an opportunity and they've, they've got that data and they've come up with an idea. And I think that that's pretty much how science starts, isn't it, really? Um, we are learning a lot more a lot more quickly about earth science um, due to technologies that we have, of course. Um, but nevertheless, as you say, there are sometimes uh, you know, instances where there is either they've got the germ of an idea, and it may well be the case, or there are two sets or three sets or more scientists and they've all got different ideas. And our role is to speak to all of these people um, and come up with the one that we think is best. But even then, we say, this might be the best idea at the moment, but there are other ideas, it's work in progress. There were so many truths that I learned uh, uh, as, as a kid. I mean, E might still equal MC squared, but there were lots of things that I learned about some of the species that I encountered when I was a, a kid, which are, are no longer fact, you know, and, and I'm excited by that. Perhaps the most dramatic example is, um, T-Rex, you know, when I was a child in the 1960s, T-Rex was brown or green, it dragged its tail, it groaned and moaned, um, it walked and sta well, it staggered actually really slowly, um, and it looked like a giant iguana. Um, now, I'm 61 years old, um, that animal has completely changed in terms of what we know about it. So in my lifetime, T-Rex has changed more than it has in the last 65 million years, and that's brilliant, I love that. Climate change is mentioned in the series, it's a, it's a thread running through it, but it's not the sole focus of it by any measure. Um, is that something, is that an area you would like to, to work in more with your work or, or say with the biodiversity crisis? I mean, you, you've been very clear about with your opinions on, on these. Our programme deals with the Earth's history and throughout the course of that history, the climate 
um, has changed radically and sometimes with astonishing results. The whole planet being frozen or the whole planet being, you know, extremely hot, much hotter than it is today. You know, crocodiles, alligators, uh, close to the poles. Um, but these are changes that, that occurred over invariably over millions of years, not, not 150 years. So throughout the course of the programme, we give a nod to the fact that we as a species are having an impact on the planet now, not just the climate, but biodiversity too. And in our final programme, when we're looking at human impact on the planet, then of course that comes to the fore. So we're really sort of setting that last programme up all the way through and providing people with the opportunity to see how fragile the world is. And if sometimes just tiny things change, they can have enormous repercussions. I've purged, you know, climate change is now not part of my vernacular. It's climate breakdown. That's what we're dealing with here. Um, and when we talk about biodiversity loss, I'm slightly troubled by the word loss because we haven't lost these species, we haven't inadvertently left them behind the shed. We've destroyed them or we've destroyed their habitats. So it's not a six mass extinction event that we're precipitating, it's a mass extermination event. And I think we have to be more precise about our language. So I think there's space for more programmes which ask people to do it to address those things head on. But the fuel to get people to want to do that is that they have to have an affinity for it. And what our series here is about is getting people to have an affinity for the most wonderful planet anywhere, because it's the only one we know that's got life on it. And the fact that it's got life like us on it is astonishing, absolutely astonishing. And surely that alone suggests to people that we can't blow it. We've got to get things right at this critical time. I'm saying you've obviously spent some time delving into the past uh, while making this series. Beyond the sort of immediate term of, of the climate crisis and the biodiversity crisis, um, what do you envision for the future of Earth, you know, maybe in the next millennia, say? Well, uh, what I like is life. I like life itself more than I like human life or any other species life, to be quite honest with you. And, and again, what this series um, shows uh, without any ambiguity is the tenacity of life. Life just wants to prosper and, 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 and will overcome enormous, almost seemingly insurmountable problems in, in order to do that. It's so hard to e extinguish all life. Yes, we've had mass extinction events, but something's got through. Um, and, and it will get through again. So whatever we do to this planet, what is most heartening to people like myself is that there will be another chapter in this remarkable history. And there will be new species, maybe completely different. When you, and again, when we look back through our uh, five programmes, at uh, the way that you know, species composition has changed uh, and species have come and gone, um, not just individual species, but the very structure, if you like, the simple structure of those environments and ecosystems is so radically changed that I would you know, give anything you know, to be able to have a time machine for an afternoon and go far into the future to see what comes next. Because whatever happens, something will come next. I just don't want the embarrassment of, you know, humankind precipitating that. You know, it's all right if a, uh, an asteroid hits or there's an enormous amount of volcanic activity. That seems justified. But we as a conscious organism precipitating that type of event isn't conscionable with, from my perspective, which is why I, I would rather do something about it. You're able to be quite positive about the sort of the future of Earth and, and the trajectory that we're on. Um, where does that come from for you? I'm, I'm positive because I know that life will survive and that's heartening for me. I'm positive because I think there's still time for humans to have some sort of life on, on, on this planet in a way where maybe my grandchildren, I don't have any thankfully at the moment, or at least not any I'm, I'm aware of that are coming. <laughs> She's now got me worried. <laughs> um, but the, uh, you know, we can adapt. We can do positive things, even at this very late stage. If we don't do them, life will be abjectly miserable or terminal for humanity. And, and, and none of us wants that. And from my point of view, it's, just, it's not just about humanity. It's about all of that other life. It's about those ecosystems which ultimately we are a part of and certainly dependent upon, because if they fail, then we will fail. So, you know, it's about fix, it's not just us fixing us, it's about us fixing everything. And we, we, we certainly have a toolkit with, you know, plenty to get going 
when it comes to addressing that. What gives me real concern is just the lack of activity, is the lack of urgency. I'm kind of hopeful outside of that. What depresses my hope is the fact that this message is not new. It's been featured in your magazine for goodness knows how many years, goodness knows how many issues, and, and we're still not doing enough, rapidly enough, to, to address those. One of the covers of your recent magazines is 1.5's gone. Now, I remember 1.5 being a viable goal. That, wasn't, that, that was tens of years ago. Not hundreds or millennia, but tens of years ago. And we failed to do that. And, and, and I, I'm not happy with that. I feel guilty that I've failed you know, to, to motivate people to make that difference. So this is a time where we really do have to step up. You know, we've got to watch the program, generate that affinity, you know, uh, read your magazine to, you know, to update the science. And then we've got to act. We've actually got to do something to make a difference. And that's what's missing at the moment. Everything else, well, not everything, but a lot of other things are there in place. It's just that desire to act that's missing. Do you think if people have a greater understanding of how the sort of natural features around them have formed and on these sort of grand geological timescales, do you think that will um, help them have a, a more a, a greater sense of urgency when it comes to uh, things like the climate crisis, things that are desired not to lose. Well, I hope that what they see in our program is that those things are, are largely impermanent. I mean, I think that one of the problems is people look at a mountain and they imagine the mountain has always been there. I mean, when I say always, I mean millions of years billions of years and they think it will always be there but of course it is new you know, most of our surface is, 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 is relatively new certainly in, in terms of its you know topographical shape even its ge geographical whereabouts and we, we deal with two supercontinents in our in our series you know we've got Pangaea and, and Rodinia um, and th the lack of permanence and the fragility is another thing that I think people need to take away from, from this series. The wonder of, 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 and the singularity of this you know, remarkable place, but also the, the, the fragility and, and, the, and the impermanence. We, we've just been here for a tiny amount of time you know, in, in this remarkable history, um, and, and we ought to appreciate that a lot more than, than we do, I think. So being able to work outside of uh, your, your principal area of, you know, of the natural world as, as we see it today, um, what was the most edifying thing that you, you got from that experience? For me, science has always been the art of understanding truth and beauty. And the key words apart from science in there are art, truth and beauty. And sometimes, therefore, when I see something which is just quintessentially beautiful, I can find that as stimulating as something that, which is artistic or scientific. And I don't feel bad about that. For me, it's a fuel. And there were a couple of times in the, in the programme and I just touched something, fossils, meteorites, something like that, you know. And all of a sudden, you know, something which is completely intangible, the idea of the other side of the universe, pretty intangible. But then you've got a bit of it in, in your hands. I mean, you know, I just really light up with that sort of stuff. We, uh, well, in one of the programmes we had a, fo uh, uh, a fossil and it had one of the very first flowers. And, and it, I mean, it was an inconspicuous little moat on a piece of uh, a rock from North America. I just sat there waiting to do the filming and I was just looking at it and there's all these fabulous flowers around us where we were filming. This is one little st you know, cross-shaped flower stuck in that rock. But the importance of that evolutionary development was utterly overwhelming you know and the fact that you could sort of touch it with your well, not eat but you know, touch that that mark with your finger I, I, I find those sorts of things you know aside from the excitement that I get from new discoveries uh, I, I find those sorts of things incredibly uplifting ever since I was a kid I was I've always been enraptured with the um, with cave paintings I'm, I'm, I'm into art and it's really interesting the way that you know we started to get to that point of making two-dimensional Im images you know and I've always wondered what what happened neurologically you know when we went from sculpting maybe but then we could do that so something changed changed perceptually in, in, in our brains and then we had a need to do that and, and you know and there's a mystery as behind all of it so cave painting has always been part of my thing you know I've even got a, so when I left that college in the 1980s I made a piece of cave wall it's hanging on in, 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 in the living room of my house someone remarked upon it yesterday they said well how's that and, and I made this piece of cave wall and during the course of my life I've done different cave paintings on it it's white at the moment because I moved and it got a bit broken so I've had to replaster it and it's repainted white and I'm going to be doing some more cave paintings on it 
we got to see those cave paintings. I went into a cave and I saw them and I can't tell you, it was just so absolutely amazing. It was in January of this year and I got home and I was just like floating around for ages. You know, I didn't want to do anything else other than think about those paintings. Because again, I have to say there's that certain sense of romance. You know, standing there in the dark, deep inside a mountain, where 13,000 years ago, another human that looked exactly like we do, you know, was in there making those beautiful drawings was just sensational and, 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 and perfect for us to choose as a, a very iconic moment when it came to humans changing what they were capable of um, and how that would have an impact on the modern world. Well, thank you so much. That's yeah. beautiful and what a lovely note to end it on. Thank you. That's um, right.